first of all good evening sir and a very warm welcome so freedom is a fundamental of a progressive society freedom of thought leads to innovation freedom of speech leads to better governance freedom of career leads to power but when it comes to freedom of sexual preference we are left with nothing but doubts questions opinions and quiver of stereotypes studying at bits we can see how the world is changing accepting diversity has become the new normal but about it is also an aspect to be taken care of june is celebrating five months but is it for real making this a big deal and lead to chaos the need is to know how lgbtq community is no different from the heterosexual community and we are the same people and to understand that the spectrum of pride colors blends into as a united white to bring this to proper ground, grounds today we have shridhar rangayan he is a critically acclaimed film producer director and a writer known to be the creator of several award winning movies on social issues being featured as an lgbt influencer I'm so sorry sir influencer on the global stage his compassion towards creating awareness and spreading progressive mindset makes it a great privilege to have him to enlighten us with the concept actions needed to make it socially acceptable and shares his insights on how future nurtures the lgbtq community i am pleased to welcome shri darangan the man himself thank you so Please. much for welcoming me thank you so we would be uh, pleased to hear a few words from you first so uh, <laughs> I also graduated as an engineer in nineteen seventy nine eighty four. I think before most of you were born even. So I did my uh, electrical engineering from uh, uh, NITK Surakal, and then I went to do my masters in IIT Bombay. Um, that was in eighty four to eighty six, and I did my masters. I shifted tracks from engineering to basically uh, graphic designing and visual communication. Uh, so that was a whole different field which opened up to me. Uh, so I left behind engineering and started working with visual arts and especially uh, films and graphic design. Um, so for me, uh, uh, basically, from a journey from a small town in south of India, uh, where I come from, to being in uh, Mumbai at the epicenter of LGBTQ activism, uh, has been a huge journey. Uh, i never expected that when i was growing up i was a very shy introverted boy uh, very much to myself and never basically opened up to, i didn't have too many friends i didn't open up to anybody because i i think the complexities for a child gay child or a lesbian child or a trans child exist even uh, even if before they themselves come to know their own orientation or gender identity uh, because within them they feel the thing they might not be able to express it outside but uh, within them they are uh, scared why am i different from other persons you know so that always existed for me when i was growing up and remember that was also 1970s and 80s and 90s when there was absolutely no information about uh, um, homosexuality or lgbtq issues at all anywhere to be seen uh, the print media was not covering us the television media there was hardly any uh, movies at all uh, uh, about lgbtq topics so Growing up was a very frightening and lonely experience. So only when after I completed my masters and uh, only after several years, only in 1990, I managed to come out uh, to my close friend, and that was uh, triggered by a copy of Bombay Dose, which was India's first gay newsletter. Uh, that was published in 1989, the first of uh, uh, 1989, the first copy, and I got a uh, uh, got a copy of that given to me by my friend, and when I read that. particular magazine from front to back i my whole uh, uh thing changed my, i mean i always thought like being gay or being homosexual was my personal identity i realized that it has to become my political identity and that would come out so from the second issue of bombay dose i was on board and then of course like going on from there to starting uh, hamsa for trust in 1994 and then uh, solaris pictures in 2001 uh, solaris pictures a production company which basically focuses on lgbtq films and starting kashish mumbai international queer film festival in 2010 um this has been a huge journey and i never expected it and none of my people who around me expected uh, me to uh, come out so openly 
uh, there was a bit of quite a bit of a, 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 a hesitation and anxiety even for myself. And I, I mean, I came out when I was 26 or 27. Nowadays, youngsters come out when they're 12 or 13 or 15. So uh, I was a very late bloomer. So, uh, but it's been an interesting journey, not what I expected in the, uh, uh, um, when I started off, but like, I really think it's been very fulfilling because I've been true to myself. Uh, I'm not living a double life. I'm not lying to anybody. Well, whatever you see in front is who I am from within. Um, also, I get to do the kind of work which I want to do, uh, focusing on LGBTQ ideas and topics and discussions. And uh, so it's been a very liberating experience. I just turned 60 this year, so I'm a dinosaur compared to all of you. But uh, um, as I said, it's been a fulfilling journey and I'm looking forward to more years of good work, uh, interacting with the youngsters and learning from them. So you can ask me any questions about anything and I can just answer it. Thank you for having me on this. Sir, your journey has been one of inspiration to many LGBTQ youth. And I can say from personal experience, reading through everything you've done, it has been a great inspiration to move forward. And um, so without any delay, let's begin today's session. So, sir, my first question to you is, in today's world, it is very easy to be educated and informed of the problems that queer people face. One such problem has been the representation of queer actors in the film industry. As a film director, how do you feel about the recent movement that it demands only queer actors should be hired for queer roles? I really would like to see a day when uh, um, there's a complete equal playing ground where everybody is completely equal and everybody gets their uh, uh, roles or parts or job according to the merits of who they are. But till that time happens, because I think LGBTQ people are basically still marginalized within the uh, society. Uh, they do not have, I mean, though the, the Section 377 was read down in 2018, but I don't think, I mean, it just made us not a criminal anymore. I don't think it gave us the rights completely because we still don't have right to get married to our same-sex partner. We don't have right to adopt. We don't have right to nominate our partners. There's still a lot of rights. And also, I think, we need an anti-discriminatory law, uh, which has to be passed very soon. So uh, uh, the legally, basically, there could be ideas, but basically socially, the acceptance is still a far cry. Uh, maybe the metro cities like Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, they could be more uh, uh, more amenable to be uh, uh, living a more free life. I wouldn't say equal life, you know, but in the small towns and tier two and tier three cities, uh, it's still very problematic for LGBTQ people to live their life openly. Uh, still, a lot of gay men and lesbian women get married to people of the opposite gender because that's the social norm. And transgender people still have to hide their identity. So, till that time when there's a complete equitable, I would say that like we need to really kind of uh, make sure that like the LGBTQ people have provided uh, a, a space at the center. So, um, regarding uh, actors per se. I really think uh, if you're casting for a, a, a male character, you definitely hire a male actor. If you're casting for a female character, you would definitely hire the female actor, right? So in the same way, if, if you're casting for a transgender character, you should definitely hire a transgender actress. I mean, that's a basic thing. I mean, there's no two, two ways about it. So I really think that transgender, there are enough transgender actors. People say, where are the transgender actors? They might not be so well-known till now, but there are enough uh, transgender actors, both in, uh, in, uh, in the Hindi industry and South industry and Bengali industry for sure. But they need to be given place and they need to be, basically, I would say a lot of them need to be, uh, 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 there needs to be hand holding because they might not be trained actors or experienced actors, but they definitely can perform. Uh, I myself have been casting transgender actors in transgender parts uh, uh, on several of my films per se, the first film being the Pink Mirror, which had two real life drag queens playing uh, two drag queens on the screen. You can access the uh, the Pink Mirror on, uh, on YouTube. And also 68 Pages, another film where there's a transgender part, which was basically played by a real life transgender person. Um, so uh, I really think it's important to have this particular uh, uh, idea that like you need to give opportunities. And if they don't have the skill, you need to train them, have workshops. I would say create stars. They might not be stars today, but they will be stars tomorrow for sure. So I would say um, 
But regarding gay and lesbian parts, I'm not too sure that we need to have queer actors. If you can find queer actors, that's fine. Because for me, the gender presentation is more important. As I said, the transgender person should play the transgender part. That's more important. Uh, whereas gay and lesbian parts can be played by any actor, but if you can find queer actors, well and good. So I usually, what I do is when I'm casting for my projects, I uh, basically audition people from the community and uh, not from the community. Both the people come to audition and whoever uh, is the best, uh, whoever fits the best would get the part. And many of the actors I work with, I don't ask their sexual orientation. They could be gay, they could be a lesbian, they could be straight, we don't know about them. No? So only when they say on the stage saying that I'm straight, I do not belong to community, only then I say, okay, so you are. So till then I do not ask. They're basically good actors who fit the part and I audition them. And But our film recently, like Onir, is very welcoming because he has cast two uh, queer actors in queer parts. And definitely that's the way to go. But for me, as I said, like the transgender parts and also people who identify as non-binary, they should be definitely cast by people from the community because really crucial. And as I said, they're in our people. And if you don't find them, come to me and I'll guide you uh, to uh, a whole bank of uh, uh, actors who could play those parts. That's, uh, that's really so, um, the next question is, your film, Yours Emotionally, is about closeted gay men in India. Caste, culture, and economics play a huge role in queer lives and are important factors that they consider before being able to come out of the closet. With that in mind, how do you think we must look at the intersectionality between caste, class, culture, and queerness? And how can we make it more uh, sensible to uh, other college students like us? Yeah, so basically, I, I really think uh, uh, I would like, as I said, like again, a very uh, equal playing field for everybody, and there should be no boxes to be ticked or no discrimination or attainable. But the fact that, yes, the uh, there are marginalized communities within the LGBTQ spectrum. Uh, basically, the gay men and the lesbian women have been basically at the forefront. The transgender community, the non-binary persons, intersex and asexual people have been very much marginalized within the LGBTQ spectrum. So they need to be given more space at the table. Uh, at every discussion, they should be there. So I really think we should stop inviting people like me here at this week. We should be inviting more of a uh, QIA T spectrum people to be speaking because I really think we need to know more about them. For me itself also, I'm still learning about the non-binary persons and uh, intersex persons and asexual persons or other uh, uh, people within the spectrum. I'm still learning about them. So uh, for us, it's important to learn about their, uh, uh, about their identities, about their desires, about their our way of life and about their aspirations, we need to learn more about them. Only then we can able to, I would say, bring across policies where we can basically have them at the center of all discussions. Uh, in terms of like a caste, I really didn't ever think about it. I I'm a, I come from a privileged class of, uh, I'm, a, I'm, Bram, Bram, I'm a Brahmin, I come from a privileged class, but it never entered in my head that I'm privileged till the time and somebody pointed it out that like you are privileged and you are Brahmin and you are educated and you are urban. So I understand all these privileges right now and I accept that I'm privileged and I really hope that like uh, more people from the non-privileged classes would be able to access all the facilities and all the information and all the rights and their due place in the society for sure. So um, in terms of, I mean, not just caste, but even faith, definitely like Muslim and Hindu and Christians. So they, they have to be, I don't like, again, these tick boxes. I don't like to tick these boxes. These are the, but I really think it's important by that till we get equal status, we should definitely be ticking these boxes and saying, yes, I am so-and-so. I'm proud to be so-and-so. And so, -and -so. so that's really important. So the LGBTQ community uh, movement has, has been far uh, too long been led by a privileged gay and lesbian people uh, at the center. I really think we need to have more voices from the TQIA spectrum per se, speak out about the thing. And it's happening. For the last, I would say, five, six years, I've been hearing more voices. And also from the youth, 
I mean, uh, I think the older people who spoke for so long are kind of not really speaking right now. And really, the bike has been handed over to the youngsters and really is refreshing to hear them uh, uh, speak about their own aspirations. And they are the tomorrow or today, actually. They're already out the yesterday. So they are the today, uh, they are the tomorrow. And uh, I really think it's important to discuss this, bring it out in the open, and uh, acknowledge and uh, uh, underline of privileges. Yes, I am privileged. I underline that saying that, Yes, but I cannot do anything about my privilege. The only thing I can do is like hand over my privileges to somebody else if they want to accept it, you know, uh, or give them equal space on the table wherever we can. So at uh, uh, the Kashish Mumbai International Queer Film Festival, which we uh, uh, which we just completed June 1st to 5th in Mumbai. So we showed almost like 40% of uh, our films which are focused on LBT plus population. So uh, we tried to kind of program more films from the marginalized communities per se. We had a lot of films by, made by non-binary filmmakers. We had, uh, uh, I think, uh, out of uh, 148 uh, uh, films, I think 60 films by, by by female filmmakers and non-binary filmmakers. So the best we can do is like, we are trying to kind of give them their uh, space and their voice and the platform. Uh, then it's for the audience and the filmmakers to take it ahead to kind of see how they can spread the message and, talk about their aspirations and dreams. Um, so your film, uh, Gulabi Aina, it, it focuses on a lot of transsexual and how, and the problems that they face in India. How do you think that we as college students can make our campus a safer space for trans students considering that being trans is still a taboo topic in Indian culture? Yeah, I mean, I really think that uh, uh, the, uh, the transgender persons are, uh, uh, are placed in a very unique position because culturally we have had a lot more respect and place for transgender persons in our history and mythology and uh, uh, much before the British came in uh, doing the entire thing for the transgender community. Um, they painted them as evil, they painted them as uh, uh, kind of a miscreants, etc. So I think before that, like the transgender people were very much part of the mainstream society. They were very much uh, uh, respected. They were basically accorded. And we also have uh, gods, god figures who are transgenders. So I really think within our mythology and history, we have always acknowledged the transgender community. But uh, uh, over the, the last few decades or centuries, rather, uh, the transgender community has been marginalized. And what happens is like, because they're not, I think the discrimination starts at school per se, where when they're going to school where they feel different, they want to express themselves differently and they get bullied at school. Because they get bullied by people around them, they drop out of school. So a lot of the transgender people have dropped out of school and because of that, they're not uh, educated. I mean, in, 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 in a classical way that they didn't go, uh, they didn't have access to college education, they didn't have access to postgraduate education till now, you know? Um, so because of that, their job opportunities have also been very less. But over the last, I would say, uh, over the last at least like around six, seven years, uh, since the 2016 NALSA judgment, I really think that things have little, hopefully things have little become better, where more and more transgender people are able to uh, access higher education and access job opportunities. Um, so, I mean, I mean, we do not have to categorize them separately. They are like everybody else. They have the same skill set. They can perform the same way as me and you and everybody else, you know? It's just that they should be uh, given respect in terms of the choices. If, uh, uh, if a transgender person uh, who is like assigned male at birth wants to express himself herself as a female, they, they should be given uh, uh, the right to do that and the space to do that and accorded respect. So I know that like in colleges and in schools it's gonna be challenging. So what we need is basically have more uh, uh, awareness created among the teachers because the first person the, uh, the trans, trans kid basically goes to his a teacher when he, is, uh, he or she is bullied. And the teacher usually uh, scolds this person and says, why don't you behave? So the onus finally is on the trans kid to behave normally as they call it. So the teachers, if they understand that uh, we need to be more sensitive towards the trans kid's operation, uh, aspirations. So I really think awareness at the school level to uh, uh, both the teachers and the administrators that staff is really crucial. And next step is, of course, a family, because once the uh, trans kid, basically the second place where uh, he or she wants to express themselves is basically at the home. And if the parents do not understand who a trans person is, they could be victimized at home too. 
And once they're victimized in school and home, they run away from home. And then they are left to the, uh, basically the uh, vagaries of the societies where they can go. They sometimes join the Hijra clan where they find more protection because of a, 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 kind of a cultural and social acceptance within the Hijra clan. So, but right now, I think a lot more uh, uh, awareness has happened and a lot more transgender uh, persons have been accessing higher education, accessing job opportunities. I think at colleges, what we need to be sure is like we should not address anybody by their wrong pronoun. You need to ask what is your pronoun, preferred pronoun. Like I might be kind of dressed as a male person, but I might, my aspiration might be to express myself in a feminine gender. So I, I may want to be called as she and her. So you need to ask me before you're addressing uh, he or me to me. So you should ask me whether what's my gender preferred gender for now. No? So otherwise, if you cannot ask that, I would say use a name, Sridhar, uh, Bhavya, that's it. You know. So that's like neutral. Uh, or just ask for the preferred gender pronoun and make sure that you use a gender pronoun. Don't use the wrong pronoun because that really is something hurts the transgender person a lot more. They have left that identity behind. So for them to be reminded that, and also like I mean, asking strange questions. When did you realize uh, that you are a transgender person? Uh, how do you date somebody? How do you do this? How do you do that? These are not necessary questions, right? I mean, if you are really very close to your friend, if that transgender person is a very close friend of yours, then that person will tell you everything without you asking. So I would say that behave quote unquote normally with everybody, you know? And uh, also when you're asking, uh, anybody for the matter, did you, uh, um, like if you're asking, did you go out your, with your girlfriend for uh, uh, the weekend? Instead of asking, did you go out to your, with your girlfriend to the, for, the, for the weekend? Just ask, did you go out with your partner for the weekend? It's very simple. These are very minor adjustments you can make, you know? Uh, instead of making girlfriend, boyfriend and putting them into binaries, just use not neutral words like partner, them, it's more easier. I think that's why you can't, then you will be able to not be discriminatory uh, and be more, I would say, uh, uh, empathetic uh, to everybody's needs. So I think it should start at college, school level, first of all, but college is the most important place where a lot of transgender people drop out. If you're able to be sensitive and use the correct pronoun, use the correct uh, expressions and give them respect, I really think uh, we can have a long way in, uh, for their equal rights. Yes, sir. That is, that is really insightful, sir. And uh... You completed your education from NIT Surat Kal and from and I'm from an engineering background. How can films incorporate the engineering space and bring about a change in perception of the college life of engineers? <laughs> That's a very tough question. Basically, I, I, I since I'm an engineer, I think about everything in a very kind of structural, procedural, logical way. So even when I construct a script, uh, I would kind of engineer an emotion. That's what I would call, you know. So I would want a certain uh, a, a, a bavia to cry at a certain scene. So I would engineer an emotion by writing a scene which would trigger off a, 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 a crying emotion with bavia. Or if I want to trigger a, a laughing emotion, I would raise it. So I would say, like, I would plan my script in a way that's to engineer emotions. And also, like, I think... Uh, being an engineering student, it helps me in budgeting better and uh, workflow better and uh, scheduling better. So I finish my films faster in lesser budget. And also kind of, I think I'll be able to reach marketing logically. How do you kind of take a film forward, you know? So for, I would say, uh, any engineering students to become filmmakers, I would not advise it because don't leave your cushy job and become penniless filmmakers. So my father never liked that. So my father always hated that uh, I left my engineering uh, and went to a filmmaking, which does, is a very, very challenging thing. And I mean, if you make the big bucks, that's a different thing. But like for us independent filmmakers, it's always a, a matter as to how do you survive? It, there's no regular income per se, you know? So uh, I would say that like, you, you preferably don't, but if you're really passionate about it, do go for it. Um, I really think of, uh, what you should do is like uh, for a uh, filmmaker, for basic thing to become a filmmaker, I would say is like become a script writer, first of all. You can of course also direct other people's script, but first of all, if you can write your own scripts because uh, you're passionate about an idea, but you just cannot go and make a film about an idea. You need to develop the script. You need to structure it. You need to, as I said, engineer an emotion, you know, 
So I really think it's important that people learn the craft of writing, which I think is very, very right now in India has not been given enough focus. I really think script writing should be the focus, first focus, where everybody kind of develops the script. And you cannot just develop the script in just like two days. You need to sit over it, rework it, make iterations, make many drafts till that script is totally polished, you know. And I would say take uh, help from your colleagues and your friends so that like finally when you are ready to shoot the film, the script is perfect. Uh, so a lot of the young filmmakers just don't pay attention to script writing. They have an idea and they go and shoot tomorrow and edit it day after and ready with the film the third day. So I really think it's important. If you want to go, go the long way, you know, if you want your films to win awards, travel the film festival circuit and be distributed, I really think it's not enough to just have a germ of an idea, but it needs to develop fully uh, to its fullest potential through proper script writing. And I would say uh, seek help. I would say seek mentors, you know, who are already experienced. A uh, lot of people are ready to help, including me. So don't, but like, don't work hard with you. Uh, I'm ready to help uh, try to kind of uh, uh, polish any script or mentor any script per se. So I really think uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, engineering, I really think it's important to see more LGBTQ films. So uh, Kashish has a, 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 a initiative called Kashish Forward, where we have been taking LGBTQ films to colleges across uh, India. We already done around 45 screenings across India, and we want to take it ahead. Uh, I, I hope to be invited to Bits Pilani to screen physically. I don't want to do the online screening anymore. So I want to be there at Bits Pilani. And it's been a great learning experience when we screen films at colleges because the young people who watch these films, uh, they get it much more than the elder, older generations. They're with the film, they cry and laugh with the film. And there's so many beautiful questions and they talk to each other. And many times uh, these sessions also help uh, the LGBTQ persons who could be closeted within the campus to be more comfortable. They might not open up right away there, but it makes them more comfortable that they can see the mirror of their own uh, lives on the screen. And they might be able to open up to some of their very close friends, etc. So nowadays, I think a lot of the colleges have an LGBTQ uh, 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 group, like IIT Bombay has Sati, I don't know that Pitch Pilani has a, a, a LGBTQ and ally group. So if you don't have, you should form one for sure. Because uh, basically, a lot of times, it's basically the allies who form these groups with a few LGBTQ people who could be open. And there could be a lot more LGBTQ people who may not be open, but could right now join as allies. But later on, they will have the strength to come out. So I really think it's important to have these uh, campus groups, uh, LGBT friendly per se. So uh, if you don't have one, you should have one. Do you have one in this, um, We have one in uh, all three of our campuses. Pilani has Anchor, uh, Goa has Querious Bits, and Hyderabad, we have Queer Consortium. Wow, okay, perfect. Um, it would be also great to have you here to screen when we reopen again. Sure. Um, many people in the older generations are uneducated and uh, homophobic due to religion or just not being able to understand the LGBTQ community, how do you think we should go about helping someone, say our parents or professors, understand the problems faced by the community and educate them so that we have safer spaces? Yeah, I mean, uh, I really think because, I mean, uh, um, yeah, as I said, like the older generation did not have access to basically information uh, about LGBTQ uh, ideas and aspirations. Uh, it was a way, as I said, till almost 1990 or 2000s, absolutely, it was a closed chapter. Nobody talked about LGBTQ uh, 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 topics at all. Nobody talks about homosexuality. No, nobody talked about being gay or lesbian out, outwardly. So I really think that like access to information is a key. Uh, so I would say uh, uh, show more films to your professors. Uh, give them books to read. Uh, you should make them read. They might just say, oh, I have to, to read already. Please read this uh, one, one book, maybe. You know? So, um, or I would say have uh, uh, people visiting, as I said, like I mean, either to film screenings or talks or something, and make sure the professors attend. Or I, I have seen this. I mean, with, uh, maybe I don't know. There are some professors also watching this particular show, but like uh, most of the times, is the students who come to these uh, uh, programs, events, and most of the staff members and administration people kind of not really attend these sessions. 
I've seen that like across my 45 screenings which I've done. And that's really a sad part, you know. Uh, uh, very few uh, staff members, um, the, the professors do join the uh, uh, events. I really think we need to encourage them to uh, join and make it more, I would say, uh, conducive or maybe just have a screening or a talk only for professors uh, or uh, uh, the, the teaching staff, you know. I would say that like instead of having the entire people, because they might not be comfortable to be among the students, maybe, I don't know. So I would say that like have a session only for the teaching staff. Uh, whether it's an, uh, a talk session or a screening session or a workshop or a discussion session, have it only for the teaching staff with just a, a few students facilitating the entire thing. I think that would work in changing the mindset. In terms of the society, uh, the elder, older generation definitely needs a lot more uh, 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 awareness, a lot more films. Like, I mean, I would say like my film Evening Shadows has been watched a lot by, uh, uh, I would say, non LGBTQ parents, families generally. It was on Netflix for three years. And I used to get messages from, uh, as I said, general family people who watch these films and said like, well, now I have a little better understanding about LGBTQ lives uh, or gay men or gay mothers right now. So um, I really think it's important to have more films, more books and more talks, uh, even for the society, so uh, uh, general society. Uh, it's going to be a little challenging because they are set in their whole norms, etc. They are kind of preconditioned. They have their baggage, uh, which has been handed down over generations. I really need, but I think people, like I'm 16 now, if I can learn, anybody can learn. So I really think that people can learn and um, should be made to learn and understand. But one of the things I would say for youngsters would be to kind of have more conversations instead of confrontations. A lot of youngsters would want to kind of say very vocally, this is who I am, this is what it is, like, please accept it. It takes time. I would say it has taken you 23 years to come to terms with your own sexuality, give your parents a little, at least a few years for them to understand. I would say uh, handhold them. Uh, it's okay. It's not going to belittle you to handhold them in understanding. So uh, I think the older people can definitely learn from the younger people and you should be able to teach them what is LGBTQ ideas, what are the difference between a gay and lesbian and transgender persons, what are the difference between asexuality and polyamory. You can do that for sure. I would say be patient. You can tell them three, four times and they'll get it. You know? So a little more patience with the youngsters would be needed uh, for the older generation to come to terms. But I still feel that there's a lot more ignorance within the younger generation also. Let's not say that like all young people are woke and aware and etc. And all older generation are not aware. That's not true. Younger people also, I mean, are just not, even if they're aware and woke, they will not accept it. They, there's so much of homophobia within a uh, uh, younger generation. There's so much of campus bullying uh, still happening, you know. So we need to be more aware that like it's not just a generation, it's basically people uh, who are different. Uh, younger people or older people who do not want to accept uh, new ideas and new realities need to basically accept that per se. So I really think it's important to have conversations, not confrontation. That's all I would say. Yes, sir. So that was really great advice, to be honest. And I hope that um, everyone listening from the community or otherwise will have taken your advice. Um, it's so, not an advice, it's just a suggestion. <laughs> I don't want to advise because it makes me too old. and So I don't want to advise anymore. I just want to give suggestions. If you want to take it, it's fine. If you don't take it, let it be. <laughs> um, so all your queer films were made uh, around in the early 2000s. How do you think like the situation has changed since then for queer people? And what major differences do you notice nowadays? So I really think like uh, uh, mainstream cinema has taken note of the fact that LGBTQ uh, characters have to be included in their storyline. Uh, uh, there's a lot more, I would say, more positive and more empathetic uh, uh, roles being provided to queer characters of late over the last one decade, I would say. Uh, since 2018, there's been a flood of films per se. Not so many films as much as OTT web series. Every OTT web series nowadays have a queer character, whether it's needed or not. That's like pink washing a bit. So we need to make sure that like such pink washing does not happen because we don't need tokenism. We need representation. So we need to be represented properly, adequately, and have a place in the larger story, not just thrown in there just to say, okay, I have a gay character, I have a lesbian character. That's not really necessary for 
it doesn't do anybody any good per se no so i really think uh, a lot more has happened i would say oh since 2018 a lot more good films have been released uh, uh, evening shadows ek ladki ko dekha to aisa laga chumal jada sardan and the recent badai do all have been kind of really i would say change makers in their own way and uh, more films coming up uh, very soon uh, but the ott revolution has been huge because i think uh, serials like web series like fame game and uh, uh, akkad bakkar rapu chakkar had a beautiful uh, lesbian story in it and uh, inside edge had a beautiful gay story um then the the gili puchi and bai two short films within the anthologies were great so there is definitely very good work happening but what is not happening right now is like queer people are not telling their are not been given opportunities to tell their own stories most of these projects have been held by non queer people at the uh, at the help you know and a lot of them are not even uh, kind of co opting or collaborating with lgbtq community so it's fine i'm not saying only lgbtq people should tell their own stories but i would say if you are a non lgbtq person i would say collaborate with people from the community but i know is a classic example basically that collaborated with a gay fashion designer you know costume designer and he gave so many inputs to the film that like it kind of uh, rounded up all the characters and made it more real and more palpable you know so really i would say have lgbtq people and the enough talent whether it's a a uh, 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 dop the uh, the camera person sound recorders a uh, uh, direction assistant costume designers there's so many people from the lgbtq community i would say collaborate with them so that you have a better understanding of lgbtq lives they can shape your film better or i would say have script writers we have wonderful uh, lgbtq script writers available so use them i would say um, uh, uh, and also you definitely have to uh, ensure that like proper representation they equal i won't say equal footage i mean that's not the how much duration on the screen but if the character is there it should have a meaning in the story it should have proper uh, uh, a reason for it to be the story and it should have a rounding off not just left uh, okay. so the, these are the things i really think things have changed for sure i've seen change but i really think it's necessary for queer filmmakers and queer actors and writers and uh, uh, all the cast members and crew members to get their place uh, and due credit you know and uh, get them to tell their own stories so i really think the short films which we showed kashish are really the beacons of hope um uh, i think this year we showed 30 indian lgbtq films at kashish 30 can you believe that so uh, we got i think a uh, submission of around 50 indian lgbtq films so so many are being made every year so we showed 30 of them and there were four feature length lgbtq films so that was like amazing but these films do not have a proper avenue for to reach the audiences because they are short films documentaries independent films which do not have the marketing budget you know? so or big stars so we really need to be able to so kashish recently has tied up with mx player and the disney hotstar so we are able to find up find a whole channel of on mx uh, player of kashish lgbtq films you know? so uh, yeah so like i think we have put out around 25 or 27 of them on mx player so you can uh, search on mx player i think you can save kashish on mx player and you should be able to find it otherwise i'll send you a link so it's been uh, so we need more distribution for these short films to reach to the audiences you know and uh, also we have been screening at colleges and camp also corporate houses community centers so so somewhere or other you should catch an lgbt film uh, a sensitively made lgbt film which will change your mindset for sure so what i'm yesterday i was at a screening uh, uh, at uh, in bombay Uh, of my mother's girlfriend which is a film which is produced by kashish art foundation and lotus visual production so everybody in the audience there were at least around uh, around 80 90 of them they really enjoyed the film they were with the film they clapped at the right moment they laughed at the right moment and they said like uh, the film is about uh, 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 two elderly working class women uh, it's a beautiful love story between a muslim woman and a hindu woman working class people you never see these stories of elderly people elderly lesbian people so it was very heartwarming to see the reaction of the audience and they i would say they went back with a changed mindset that and the film is called my mother's girlfriend so uh, then they can actually go back and think okay maybe my mother also has this sexuality i mean people we do not think that parents can have any sexuality at all yes. whether heterosexual or homosexual you never they they supposed to be asexual or else so you can quite think that like maybe by mother also by have a sexuality aspect to her uh, and how do we kind of respect that anyway so uh, i really think uh, uh, films can change the mindsets if presented well 
if uh, the communication is clear and if you can trigger the right emotions, as I said, definitely couples can do the change. Sir, do you think there have been like regressions or drawbacks to the queer movement due to technological process in the past 10 to 20 years in any way? So, yeah, I mean, I'm a bit of a, uh, yeah, I'm a bit of a prude in that, like, because earlier, before the internet uh, revolution came, basically, the, the social media revolution started, you know, I would say, there was a lot more, I would say, more uh, meetings in on ground. Uh, people would meet on ground, interact with each other personally, uh, hang out with each other more. Um, also, like, I mean, if you had a, a protest march or a celebratory march, a lot more people would join on the ground. Nowadays, they're going to be invisible. We'll have more allies joining us rather than LGBTQ community members. And that's a tragedy, you know. So I think everybody is busy with their own life online. That's fine. But I would say you should have a second life on ground. You have your first life definitely online. So, uh, but second life on ground. And I really think we need to meet more people in person, hug more people, smile, at, look at each other physically. I really think it's important to uh, human connect, you know. Uh, it is such a pleasure, like the last two years, because of the pandemic, we basically held online editions of Kashish, you know. This year, uh, June 1st to 5th, we had the physical festival. It was such a huge pleasure uh, having around uh, 1,000 people, 1,500 people coming to Liberty Cinema, watching films as a community, as a filmmaking community, film-going community. Uh, it was a huge thing. I mean, I really think it's important to be a physical basis. Whether it's like a five people gathering or a 20 people gathering or 100 people or 1,000 people gathering, but it's really important to make the effort to travel, be there. You know? A lot of us say, oh, who will go there? I mean, even if a friend calls, you will say, Are, who's going to go all the way to meet a friend? Yeah, let's like, uh, chat online. You know. So I really think it's important to just meet people. You know? uh, well, I think the pandemic hopefully it's over, I mean, it's over now. I don't know whether it's, I wouldn't, no, I have no comments on that. So basically uh, a pandemic has put a, a halt to a lot of these physical meetings. But even before pandemic, I would say the social media really put an end to a lot of physical meetings and physical interaction. I really think we need to bring it back, have that human connect, you know? And that's when basically I really think more uh, uh, real conversations can happen and more real action can happen. I would say that internet is great, but I would say, if you sit together and ideate in a room, I think you can come out with more concrete ideas than an online uh, meeting. That's what I would say. That's, I mean, maybe because I'm from the older generation, maybe you think differently, but that's what I think. Sir, I completely agree with your point here, to be frank, that offline interactions are much more fulfilling compared to online interactions in many ways especially after two, three years of being stuck at home and then being allowed to go to college. <laughs> right. So, um, also, sir, um, what major aspects or factors of the modern culture do you think will help improve the awareness or acceptance of the LGBTQ community in the near future? Like, do you think the Indian mindset has a chance of being affected by the global changes that are happening all around us? Yeah, I, really think, I mean, uh, definitely it's happened already. Like, things have changed, as I said. Like, I mean, I'm very happy uh, in my own lifetime to see changes happen. I never thought Section 37 was going to be read down. I never thought that the transgender rights bill would be passed. I really think these changes have happened. And I think a lot of, also like I'm seeing LGBTQ films uh, in theaters, a mainstream uh, of LGBTQ films played out in theaters and people going, buying tickets to go and watch. I would have never imagined that would happen in my lifetime, but it's happening. And I'm sure there would be change, uh, uh, definitely better changes. I really hope that's uh, uh, because I've already a partner with a partner for 27 years uh, and I really would like to marry that person, you know, come on like I, if I've lived for so many years with my partner at least the least I can do is marry him and basically he should have the right over my body and my uh, property I don't have much property but at least like if I'm ill tomorrow he should be able to go to the hospital and sign for me and if he cannot do that what is the point of us being together for 27 years and loving each other, so I really think same sex marriage rights is needed mainly for this, you know whether you call it a marriage right or a civil union partnership, whatever, some kind of a rights has to be there for same-sex partner for sure. And I'm I'm fine with like a lot of people do not want uh, to kind of uh, vote for a same-sex marriage rights, uh, even from the community. They want to be single and happy. That's fine. But I would say for whoever wants to marry, they should be the right at least. Yes. What I'm saying, you know? 
so that has to be there. And as I said, the anti-discriminatory law has to come into place so that nobody is discriminated based on their sexuality or gender identity or sexual orientation. Definitely that should be in place. And uh, we should push for these legal, and we cannot do it on our own. The LGBT community cannot do it on its own. We need the allies, we need the youngsters to join the movement to make sure that the petitions are heard uh, at the uh, uh, state and the uh, national level. So I really think uh, uh, these are very important steps per se to kind of bring about. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I've seen changes happen and I'm very happy. And uh, I think the youngsters can definitely take charge and move ahead and build a glorious future where everybody is equal. Yes, sir. <laughs> Um, um, and how do you think like we can increase the amount of queer representation in like modern media? I mean, it's been increasing for the last few years, but again, it is still a lot less compared to heteronormative representation in modern media. So how do you suggest we can do that? So I, really think, I mean, I think it's happening quite well because I really think more and more people are coming out, uh, youngsters are coming out with their own identities and their own stories. Um, the social media is doing a great job in propagating these stories. And so well, let's look at not just the mainstream media or the language. And also I think what we need is like more information and uh, uh, stories on the language media. We don't have, we, our focus is completely on English language. You know? We need to be focusing on regional languages like Marathi, Bengali, or Tamil and everything. So we have to really work very hard in having our stories in regional media because a lot of the I would say the Tier 2 and Tier 3 city uh, audiences would be accessing only regional language media. We need to be screaming out loud in Hindi. Definitely. We need to be screaming out loud in Marathi and Tamil and Telugu for sure. We are not doing that enough. We are focused on uh, uh, English right now and really need to change that discourse. No? So we need more people from the community speaking up in their own languages no? across India. That's the way to change mindset for sure. And uh, also I really think uh, a lot more, I would say, and enough journalists uh, uh, within the uh, uh, enough LGBTQ journalists within the media uh, fraternity, they need to really push the envelope a little more. They cannot just be sitting behind and saying, "Okay, we just write uh, stories about Bollywood stories or the main news line." They should really, even with all the work they do, they should push one story which is about LGBTQ ideas. You know, uh, so I would say the LGBTQ people uh, media. Within the fret, media fraternity, should really push the envelope and create more stories for sure. Uh, only then, I would say there'll be more space. Uh, yeah, I mean the allies can do only so much, but we should take responsibility to push our own stories. You know? Okay, sir. Um, lastly, could you tell us about like the Kashish Mumbai Indian Queer Film Festival and the sig its significance and relevance in a country like India? What are the roadblocks that you and your other organizers faced or still face? And how was this year still different from the rest? Okay, so it's a long story. It'll take up a whole year, but that's fine. I'll just condense it in two minutes. So basically we started in 2010, uh, uh, immediately after uh, the Delhi High Court reading down a section 377 in 2009. Uh, Delhi High Court read down section 377 effectively decriminalizing homosexuality in 2009. And that's when we got the impetus saying that we can do a mainstream film festival. The idea there have been film festivals in the past which were held in colleges or cultural institutions. What we wanted to do was place the LGBTQ film festival in a mainstream space you know, for not just the LGBTQ community to celebrate their own aspirations on the big screen, but also for the non-LGBTQ community to basically see what uh, uh, LGBTQ stories are about. Usually there's hardly, because there's no release, uh, there was no uh, films being released on LGBTQ uh, uh, stories at all in the theaters, you know. So we want to create a space where non-LGBTQ people can come and watch films, you know. And that's been successful right from 2010 when we started with a small uh, one screen in PBR cinema, 123 seats, now to Liberty Cinema, which houses 1,200 seats, you know. And we pretty much fill up so many seats. People come in droves to Liberty Cinema to watch films. So I really been an interesting journey for us, not just in the scale, uh, in terms of the number of people attending, but the kind of a almost 30% of the attendees are non-LGBTQ community members. For them, it's an eye-opener, watching these films, short films, documentaries, it's not just a mainstream crap, but basically real films, which are from across the world, from India, from across the world, watching these films basically is an eye-opener for them. And also for them to interact with LGBTQ members, you know, in a space which is safe, you know. 
uh, people who are openly proud and are, are, are there with their full regalia, with full makeup, pets, costume and everything. So it's a beautiful experience. Who wants to wear their badge, they can wear it. But if, if they don't want to wear a badge, they can be anonymous, uh, unidentifiable at Kashish. Everybody is welcome. It's a safe space. So it's been a very huge, wonderful intermingling of LGBTQ community and non-LGBTQ community within the five days of the festival, you know. And it's changed people's lives. For the LGBTQ community members, it's been a dating, they've dated people. The relationship has happened and progressed. And uh, for the non-LGBTQ people, as I said, it's the first time sometimes that they've ever met a lesbian woman who's open and speaking. And speak. They might have a lesbian woman in their own family, but they will not know. So yeah. when they meet up, who's open, they kind of uh, eye opens per se, their mind clears up. So they are forced to think differently than what they've been thinking in the past. And also we have had a huge support from the film fraternity. Uh, so we have had some, some of the biggest stars come to Kashish and that amplifies the voice you know, beyond the festival uh, space per se. Um, so it's been an uh, interesting, uh, last two years, as I said, the pandemic has kind of put us a little more on the back foot. Uh, also the sponsorship has been difficult because most of the companies uh, who are supporting us have not been able to, many of the companies have not been able to support us again because of the financial troubles they themselves are having. But I'm sure like, I mean, this year we managed to hold the film festival uh, in person and online. We're going to do that for sure in the future years. Uh, the message of Kashish is that everybody is equal. Everybody needs love and everybody needs acceptance. Whether I would say even a heterosexual persons need acceptance and validation of the existence in many ways. Not accept acceptance in the uh, uh, queer way, but I would say everybody is looking for validation of their self, you know, from families, from colleges. Every non-queer person is also trying to achieve, right? All the, all the time they're trying to achieve and validate their own existence. They want to get better than who they are. So similarly, I would say queer people also need validation of who they are and not necessarily, but they can validate themselves. They do not need validation from the uh, society, but self-validation is the most important thing and self-identification is the most important thing. I think uh, Kashish facilitates that, you know, for people to be free and people to be themselves and people to enjoy a, a, a community space. I mean, I'm saying when I say community, it's a film community space, you know, where everybody comes to watch films and um, it's a beautiful experience. So next time you're in Bombay, you should come to Kashish next June. <laughs> sure, sure, sir. That would be great. So with this, the session comes to an end. We know it would be great to keep listening to him and digging him about the Pride Month and LGBTQ community, but we are running short of time now. We hope that this talk created a sense of inclus inclusiveness in our viewers' perspective and contributed to germinate, to germinate a seed of vital thought in your minds. We are glad to have listened to remarkable insights on the community by none other than Sridhar Rag Rangan, the man himself. I'm, it was an honor to interact with you and we hope to host you in our campus soon, sir. Perfect. I'll be very happy to be there. And uh, thanks everyone for listening in. And as, as Bhavya said, let the germ today, which you heard, could kind of germinate within you and maybe it'll sprout a uh, plant of change within you. Thank you so much for listening to us. <laughs>